do you think that that's underlying what we're seeing there with this tremendous increase in speculation by retail? Is it similar to, to what you were talking about in the 30s? I, I think that, yeah, that's a big factor. Uh, I do think that the, basically the a growth of the money supply kind of encourages this sort of activity, even if they're not aware, even if they can't tell you how much the M2 money supply, uh, they feel it. They, they feel the price is going up. They, they're getting the stimulus checks. You know, they're, they're just kind of responding to that as, as, as you'd expect. In addition, I think it, it goes deeper than that because it's also kind of a distrust of institutions. Uh, that, that generally kind of tends to accompany these kind of long-term debt cycles, right? So anyone familiar with the book, The Fourth Turning, for example, knows these, these kind of, you know, rotations that can happen in terms of, of say, rising populism and, and lower trust of the establishment. And so we've been in an environment for the past decade where, you know, the economic recovery in, in most countries was not very robust. So the United States, Japan, Europe, uh, emerging markets uh, in general, except for a handful that did very well, uh, most of them have kind of had a pretty slow recovery. Uh, there's, there's, you know, especially in the United States, very high levels of wealth concentration, uh, higher than normal in, in history. We have to go back again to like the 1920s to kind of find a, a similar environment. Uh, and so, you know, with all those factors, uh, even though, say, financial assets recovered very well, I mean, the S&P 500 got to new all-time highs and then blew past those all-time highs, even though the economy kind of you know, didn't spring back very quickly in the in the past decade. And so people feel they, they kind of acutely feel the separation between financial assets uh, and uh, the real economy. And so they kind of feel like it's rigged against them. And I think in many ways they're correct. Uh, and so there's kind of that natural tendency of, of hey, you know, you know, like Wall Street bets, like we can go in and stick it to the hedge funds. We can go and, and kind of, you know, uh, do similar things that they're doing. And so I think that's kind of naturally playing out. You have that kind of uh, kind of anger towards the establishment, as well as that kind of general sense that that currency was devalued this past year, and that you know, in, in some ways, it makes sense to kind of go into assets rather than just hold that cash. Where do you think, I guess, it fits in to the macro outlook at the moment? Yeah, and so you know, the inflate the tra- the in- question of inflation being transitory, I think it has to be broken into a couple different parts. And so one is that people are often using transitory in ways that they contradict someone else's uses of the term. And so I like to separate into transitory in rate of change terms and transitory in absolute terms. And so if prices say, say there's like a, a bottleneck somewhere uh, and prices temporarily go up, but then that bottleneck is resolved and prices go back down, that'd be a transitory thing. It was a kind of a one-time thing. It, it's gone now, we go back to normal prices. However, if prices go up due to, due to that, and then they don't they don't keep going up. They eventually level off, but they stay at that new level. Uh, that means that that inflation was transitory in rate of change terms, uh, but not transitory in absolute terms. Right. And so so generally in history, when we see these these large increases in the broad money supply, uh, and so for example, for people, you know, back in 2008, people talked about you know the risk of hyperinflation because of QE, uh, but mostly that that was increasing base money that was staying in the banking system. It's not getting out into the broad money supply. What we saw in 2020, uh, and, and to a lesser extent in 2021, is that you know the combination of fiscal spending with uh, deficit monetization increased the broad money supply at a rate that we haven't seen year over year since the 1940s. And even though that again that money supply growth rate is leveling off, it's not going up at the same rate that it was last year. But that money is not being taken out of the system either. We permanently have a higher level of broad money, and so it's natural that we're seeing on average a permanently higher level of prices. So we had this big, big kind of stepwise increase in prices. I think the big question now is not whether or not those prices will come back down. I think most of them will not. I mean, wages are sticky. Uh, you know, when, when Procter Gamble and Coca-Cola and Chipotle raise prices, those are sticky price increases. Uh, the semiconductor shortage is, is not really kind of abating anytime soon. Uh, some of the supply chains have to be reorganized. Uh, you know, uh, furniture things are up like 10, 20% year over year in terms of prices. Uh, and so you can have individual prices come back down, like lumber, for example, got way too high and it's naturally coming back down. But I think a lot of these prices won't go back down to their starting point. Uh, and so I think the bigger question is, is, you know, will this will this rate of change continue? And I think that the the rate of change of inflation is cooling off now. So I think, you know, we had this kind of you know, a lot of the fiscal stimulus is behind us. Right. So people are not getting more stimulus checks. Uh, they're not you know, they're still getting some some just say child tax uh, uh, credits. Uh, you know, the Congress is still working on an infrastructure bill, for example, but that's kind of a slower rollout of that money. It's not like an adrenaline of, of getting a stimulus check uh, into the market. And so 
I think that that rate of change is probably slowing down, uh, but that I think longer term, the inflation rate will probably still be above interest rates. You can get on bank cash or sovereign bonds like treasuries. Uh, and so there's, you know, that it's a high enough inflation rate to, to basically still be a devaluation effect on your currency over time. And then in addition, you know, th this kind of round of inflation we saw happened without oil prices going high. And so right. historically, most of the, the big inflationary pulses are from higher oil prices, or at least that's a big component because it's by far compared to every other commodity combined, oil is a much bigger market and it, it impacts everything from transportation to manufacturing to energy costs, all sorts of things. Uh, and so this whole thing happened with oil just kind of returning to where it was pre-pandemic. Uh, and so but we've also had, for example, uh, you know, companies around the world have reduced their oil capex. Uh, and so, you know, supply is a little bit more limited. And so going forward as these emerging markets, for example, which are now the biggest sources of oil demand, as they come out of these lockdowns, as they come out of the pandemics, as their oil demand kind of trajectory comes back online, I think we could see kind of persistently higher oil prices in the years ahead. It'll have ups and downs. But I think that, you know, we've, we've been in this kind of 13 year oil bear market depending on where you measure it from, like 2008, mm -hmm. uh, especially the past five, six years, ever since, you know, 2015, we've been in this oil bear market. Uh, and I think that, you know, say the next five years, next 10 years could be a lot more positive for that market than, than this past period. And that would be a generally more pro-inflationary environment, uh, especially uh, when you compare it to how low yields are on, on bank accounts and, and treasuries. And so basically the idea of something like gold or Bitcoin or these other kind of hard assets is that in an environment of negative real yield, uh, those harder assets generally hold up pretty well uh, compared to holding large amounts of fiat currency. Now, fiat currency can still be useful tactically. Uh, you can still you have to pay, pay your short-term obligations, but in, in general, you wouldn't want to hold it for, for many, many years uh, for, for a large percentage of your assets. Do you think that we could ever see that hyperinflationary environment in the United States? Uh, so my, you know, my base case is not for something like hyperinflation. There are, there are kind of outcomes where it could happen. It's a non-zero risk. Uh, so the, generally for hyperinflation to happen, you need a couple of variables. So we see it often in emerging markets. It's, it's exceedingly rare in developed markets. Uh, and that's be, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, uh, there is a large, a large amount of debt out there. And that debt kind of represents demand for that currency. It could because you know when you have dollar-based debts, the only thing that can extinguish that debt is a dollar, and so there's there's debt in in the United States. There's also uh, at least uh, twelve trillion dollars of foreign debt uh, that is based in dollars, let alone all the debt they have in their own currencies. Uh, and so there is this kind of persistent demand for dollars uh, and for euros and for yen. Uh, the second thing is that you know when you look at hyperinflations of the past. Generally, it's, you know, if you look at emerging markets, they often have obligations that they can't print. So they have, say, dollar-based debts, uh, even though they're Argentina and they don't, they don't have a way to print dollars or, or, or acquire dollars. Uh, and so their local currency ends up hyperinflating as they, as they risk default, as they risk kind of a, a, a financial crisis. The second case would be, say, uh, like a, a country that lost a war and that their productive capacity was extremely damaged, like Germany. Uh, or if you do social practices uh, that can badly uh, damage the productivity of a country like, say, Zimbabwe. And so, you know, apart from those extreme events that really kind of collapse the productive base, it's hard to get hyperinflation in, in a country that controls its own currency. Now, that is, you know, especially because hyperinflation is defined as 50% inflation per month, which is basically currencies quickly becoming useless. So even by that metric, even something like Argentina is not hyperinflating, it's just having you know, superinflation. It's kind of rapid inflation, but not hyperinflation. Uh, and so the United States, if you look back in history, the highest inflation we reached was about 20% year over year, uh, which is obviously quite problematic, but it's nowhere near right. 50% 50, 50 a month. And so I, I can envision environments that are, that are say, pretty high inflation, uh, but you'd have, to, you'd have to do something structurally pretty problematic in order to get hyperinflation in one of these developed countries. You'd have to destroy the productive base enough uh, that, 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 that currency becomes rather worthless.